So hello. Good evening, everybody. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Um, if we haven't met, my name is Melissa, and I work here, of course, at Pura Vida Diver, um, coordinating our events and doing all of the fun stuff that comes with the marketing department and um, special events and activities. So Shark Month is... Um, the favorite, obviously, at Pura Vida Divers. We love Shark Month here. Um, we celebrate it in February because that is the time where we do see a ton of um, sharks migrating offshore. Um, and we have some of our locals coming back into town, like lemon sharks. Um, we have a ton of exciting events happening throughout the entire month of February that I want to let you guys know about. So we have Palm Beach Shark Dives scheduled basically every single weekend and a ton of weekdays until the end of the month. Um, these are not baited dives. They are just going out to some of our shark favorite sites so that you can actually swim alongside sharks. You can see sharks in the wild. So non-baited dives. Um, we are just going to our shark friendly sites and we're going to go ahead, do our dive drifting along the reef and see hopefully a ton of sharks. They actually saw a hammerhead offshore today, which is super exciting. All the crew came back to the shop really pumped about that. Um, so now is the time to see sharks and hopefully we can get you guys on a shark dive over the next few weeks. Um, we also have a shark photo workshop scheduled throughout the month as well. So it can be a wide angle. Um, it can be like anything from a DSLR with a housing to a GoPro or a point and shoot. Um, our photo pro Andrea really adapts the class to the type of camera that you guys bring. So if you are interested in grabbing some pictures of sharks, definitely sign up for that shark photo workshop. She's going to tell you all of her secrets and tricks and tips to getting that perfect shark shot. Um, and then we also have the shark conservation class scheduled throughout the month. So this is a patty specialty. Um, and you actually get a certification when you sign up for the shark conservation class. Um, the shark conservation class will basically make you a shark expert. So you're gonna learn all about sharks, about their biology. Uh, you're gonna learn how to identify the local species of sharks that we see offshore here in Palm Beach. Um, and you're gonna learn about the threats that are facing sharks and of course what you can do to help eliminate some of those threats in the future. Um, the conservation class includes your Palm Beach shark dive. So that's a nice little two for one. Um, so feel free to sign up for that. And of course, let us know if you guys have any questions about any of those upcoming events. So without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stephen Kajera with Florida Atlantic University. And he's going to tell you guys all about the shark migration that happens offshore. Fantastic. Well, well, thanks, Melissa. Thanks for the uh, the invitation to come and talk to you guys tonight. I, I appreciate it. I remember the last time I was able to speak at, at Pure Vida, we had a, a lovely little potluck and everyone brought some food and we all sat there around and, and ate and then we're able to give a little talk and it's been uh, a number of years now and uh, sadly we can't do that right now but at least we can get together and talk sharks for a little while this way so thanks again for the the invitation um i'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in the past but also uh focus more on some of the stuff that we're doing now um you guys are all locals down here you're all uh, divers, you're familiar with the area, you're familiar with um, uh, the sharks around here. I'm just going to fill you in on a little bit of the uh, research that we've been doing for the past uh, decade on the local population of uh, black tips that come down here every winter. So you're probably aware and familiar that um, th it's that time of year, right? It's, it's the winter time. It's February, March. This is, this is peak season for these uh, sharks to, uh, to migrate down here. And this was sort of the, the impetus for starting this work over a decade ago now. Um, I would get calls from the local media. The, the helicopters would uh, come in with their footage like this. And let's see if you can see. Uh, do you see my cursor wiggling around on the screen here? Yeah, I hope you can see that. Um, basically, uh, you've got hundreds of sharks right off the beach. This is right off, uh, you know, right off Singer Island there. Here you got people. You got three people standing here on the beach looking at the water determining whether they should go for a swim today with all these sharks here in the water. And the news helicopters would come along with this sort of footage and, and send it to me and say, should we be concerned? You've got guys literally walking along the beach with sharks right there in the water, you know, right, right beside them. Is this something that, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a big deal? What's happening down here? And I said, well, we're fortunate to live down here in South Florida, we, we can have sharks literally right off our backyard, right? Singer Island as well. Here's 
you know, houses. You can you can walk out your your backyard, walk down the steps to the beach, and there's there's hundreds of sharks streaming by. So wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be great? I would love that. I'd, I'd love to have one of these houses where I have sharks in my backyard. Um, and so you know, the idea was, what's happening? What do we know? And locals down here, we know that this happens every year, but um, it always gets a lot of attention. People want to know why, what's going on with these sharks. And so we had an opportunity to start an, uh, a study of these uh, annual shark migration. And I think the way to do it, I figured, well, the news helicopters are getting great footage. Let's study the sharks from the sky. Let's see what, uh, what's going on with sort of bird's eye view. Now, these sharks that you're seeing here by, uh, by the hundreds and, and literally thousands close to shore here, these are all black tip sharks. Um, and these uh, black, whoops, sorry. These black tips, they're, they're average size sharks. I tell people I'm five foot nine. These sharks are about five, you know, five foot nine long. Um, they're about the same size as, as us. They, they cap out at about two meters total length. So maybe six feet or so. Um, and they are here, like I said, by the uh, thousands. But the thing that's interesting is they're here by the thousands right up against the beach. And that's the difference. Other sharks are migrating down here as well in the wintertime, but they're farther offshore. So the average beach goer doesn't see them, doesn't know about them, and out of sight, out of mind, they don't care. But it's these ones that are right up against the shore. That's what gets people's attention. And so what we wanted to do was start doing a, a shark abundance survey. Where are the sharks? When are they here? How many are here? And uh, like I said, we figured the way to do this might be to study the sharks from the sky. And so I'm, uh, I'm a pilot as well, I fly. Um, and so what we were able to do is uh, rent a, a plane, a Cessna 172, a little four-seater plane, and mount a high-definition video camera out the window of the plane, as well as a, a digital still behind it that takes a picture every couple seconds. And then uh, fly a transect. We would fly initially, we just covered Palm Beach County uh, when we started. Uh, for the first few years, we just, you know, our funding was for Palm Beach County, so that's all we did. But subsequently, uh, we now have done, uh, for the past several years, everywhere from Miami up to Jupiter. And in the wintertime, what we try and do is fly once a week, um, and then throughout the rest of the year, maybe just, you know, once a month or so, just to see what the baseline is. And we keep it nice and low, 500 feet off the water. All right, so nice and low, and we go as slow as we feel comfortable in the, uh, in the plane at that altitude. So about 70 knots, 80 miles an hour uh, ground speed. And uh, with the camera recording out the window, basically we hit record and then leave it alone. It records the whole transect from Miami up to Jupiter Inlet. And uh, that way I don't have to fiddle with anything when I'm flying. I just hit record and I fly the plane. And uh, what the camera is doing is it's capturing a field of view um, in this uh, sort of cartoon example, you can see the airplane at the top here, and there's the beach with the umbrellas and all the sharks in the water. And the camera's aiming straight down, and so it's capturing a field of view from the beach to about 200 meters offshore. And I, you know, think of that as, uh, as two football field lengths, right? Football field's 100 yards, right? So 200 yards, 200 meters effectively um, offshore here. So we're focusing just in the near shore area. That's where the, that's where the people are. And uh, we want to see how many sharks are near the people. Now, we know there's more sharks in deeper water, but there's only so much you can do. We're just focusing on these ones uh, close to the beach. And the nice thing is, uh, down here in South Florida, because the water is relatively clear most of the time, you have the ability to see all the way down to the bottom. It's shallow. It's about four meters deep at the most. And so we are able to see the bottom from this survey, and so we're able to see all the sharks in the water. And the sharks are dark little specks that show up against a nice light sandy uh, seafloor. And so it's relatively easy to pull the sharks out from the background and, and see, what, uh, uh, see, what, you know, see what's there and get a good count on them. And so that's sort of the cartoon view of what happens, but I'm gonna show you an actual uh, still image of what that video camera is capturing. And the video camera is capturing a field of view, like I said, from the beach, to about 200 meters offshore. So here's the beach on the left side of the screen, the yellowy area. And then here's, this is all the water and every one of those dots is a shark. And uh, here's like the strut of the plane is at the top and the little tire on the plane is at the bottom. But uh, all those sharks in the water there, that's what we're counting. And remember, we're in an airplane, you can't stop, you're flying. And uh, it's, you know, you've got about two seconds to count how many sharks are there. All right, you ready? Go, one two, stop. 
How many sharks are there? You know, you, you can't do it. You, there's no way you can count that high. You can guess, but uh, I don't know if anyone guessed uh, 1,678, but that's how many sharks are in that, that frame if you were to pause it and go to the computer and, and, and click and count every one of them. So, you know, we, that's why we, we have to do the video. You record the video the whole time, and then we're able to take the video back to the lab and then carefully go through it and, and uh, advance it, you know, little clips at a time, little bits at a time, and then count the number of sharks and advance a little bit more and count the number of sharks. And that's how we're able to get these, uh, you know, exact numbers or these, these good estimates of, uh, of shark abundance. So what I wanna show you now is just a brief video clip, the clip from which this still was taken, just a 30 second clip to show what it looks like as we're flying along and doing this sort of aerial survey. All right, so this was um, from when we uh, started this project way back in 2011. And this is the plane flying along here and you can see the, uh, the beach on the left side of the screen. You can see all those little dots on the screen, all those little black smudges. Every one of those is a shark. Um, and uh, it just keeps going. You can see that here you've got more and more and here's, a, here's that big aggregation that I took that still from. Right, so there's you know thousands of sharks right there, and there's a boat going by, right? There's uh, more sharks. They just keep they just keep going. Even as we keep flying along here, uh, you see this this constant stream of these sharks right off the uh, beach. And just to remind you again, you know how close you are. If if you look on the left side of the screen here, here's the beach, but there's the road, right? You can you can literally drive along the road here on A1A, and you know toss a pebble and hit a shark. I mean they're they're right there, so. What we do is with this sort of video footage, like I said, take it back to the lab, and then we're able to carefully count how many sharks were there um, and, and where were they distributed. You know, so maybe we count you know, 1,000 sharks between Palm Beach Inlet and Jupiter Inlet, and maybe we count 2,000 sharks between Boynton Inlet and Palm Beach Inlet or whatever. And so we're able to see how many there are, where they're distributed, and then we do this over time to look at the abundance um, on a seasonal basis. And what we see is something like this. I promise there's only two data slides in this whole talk, too. This is one of them. And uh, here you just have the years that we've been doing this, you know, 2011 to 20, well, 2021, but I, uh, I don't have the most recent data up here. Um, and this is the number of sharks. And you can see that you have huge numbers of sharks, lots of sharks, then it drops off precipitously to hardly anything throughout the summertime. There's, there's nothing here. And then, uh, you know, around January, in you know, February, or so it starts to jump up again, lots of sharks, then it drops off to hardly anything. So you've got these annual spikes in abundance in uh, the first few months out of the year. And what's interesting is if you now overlay the water temperature data on top of the shark abundance data, um, you end up with something like this. The water temperature here is shown in red. This is the, uh, the daily temperature. Um, and what you can see is that when you have lots of sharks, it's when the water temperature is low, all right? Summertime, huge water temperature, very few sharks, all right? So you've got this, this inverse relationship. When one is up, the other is down. Temperature is up, very few sharks. Temperature is down, lots of sharks, okay? So what's interesting, I think, the most interesting thing is we've been monitoring this for over a decade now. And if you look over the past 10 years, the water temperature around here has been rising. This is the average water temperature between January and April. All right, just, and this is from a, a NOAA weather station right here in, uh, right off uh, Lake Worth Pier. Um, and what it's showing is that the average water temperature has been rising consistently um, for the past, the past decade now, all right? Remember what I said about if water temperature is up, shark numbers are down? What do you think this means for shark abundance? If water temperature has been rising for the past decade, what have shark numbers been doing? We've been doing the opposite. Shark numbers have been crashing. And so when we started this project, it was not unusual to get you know, over 12,000 sharks on a survey flight. And over the past several years, the numbers have been going down, 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 down. And last year, um, there's hardly, hardly anything. And in fact, this year, 2021, has been even worse. We've had very few sharks this year. Um, and uh, well, there's, there's a couple of confounding factors. There's a lot of beach renourishment going on around Juneau Pier right now. Um, and that's been contributing to the, the murky water. And that's also probably been you know, driving some of the sharks a little bit uh, farther offshore as well. Well, 
this is interesting because these sharks are tightly tied to temperature, right? They're, they're here when the, uh, the temperature is uh, too cold for them up north, they're following their preferred temperature farther south. And then as temperatures start to warm up up north, they're able to leave here and, and go farther north to uh, follow their preferred temperature. But these aerial surveys, they only give us the snapshot. They only tell us what's here uh, when the sharks are here. After they leave and migrate away, you know, then what do you do? We need an, another method to, uh, to look at the movements of these animals. And so what we've been doing is instrumenting sharks with satellite transmitters. And so here you have a shark caught um, right off Singer Island, bring it up beside the boat, and you can affix a satellite transmitter to the dorsal fin like this. And that way, anytime that fin breaks the surface of the water, that little transmitter is able to talk to an orbiting Argos satellite and give us a GPS location. It's able to give us the, the, the fix on the position of that shark and the, and the temperature, that, that the water temperature that that shark is experiencing at that time. And so what these satellite transmitters enable us to do is basically follow the movements of these sharks and look at their migration in real time because it's basically spitting out this information on about a 15 minute delay. So I can see within 15 minutes exactly where that shark is located as long as its, its fin is uh, above the water. And so you can get tracks that look something like this. In this example, we uh, instrumented a shark off uh, Palm Beach in March. And then every time you have a little dot here, that's a location where that fin broke the surface of the water and the transmitter was able to communicate with a satellite and, and uh, provide a, a GPS fix. And so we're able to see that this shark made its way all the way along the coast. It was hugging the shoreline all the way up. We lost it around Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, uh, a few months later. And so this enables us to look at the migration of these animals over you know, much longer distances after they've left South Florida. And in fact, if I were to put up some of the tracks from this past year, 2020, um, you can see that some of the sharks that we were tagging this year uh, went as far as um, Long Island, New York. So they were, you know, had one off Montauk in September, just right at the eastern tip of Long Island. And they were there for a couple of months before they started to, you know, chip their way back down south again. And so what this does is it gives us the, the location of these animals as they're doing their migration along the, the eastern seaboard. But like I said, it also gives us temperature, right? And so if you look at the temperature data, look at what the preferred temperatures are for these sharks, you can see that the preferred water temperature is between around 22 to 25 Celsius, right? This may be what, 72 to 77 Fahrenheit, something like that, somewhere in that range, all right? And, and the vast majority of their time is spent in that relatively narrow uh, temperature band, those, those uh, few degrees. And if you, if you uh, look at this and sort of sum this up, it's like, what, 85% of their time or something is spent within just that, that narrow temperature uh, range. You know, there's a very few that are uh, locations or um, uh, detections at colder temperatures and very few at warmer temperatures. They really like this, this range in the middle here. And so, like I said, these sharks are following this preferred range up the coast and down the coast. Um, wherever that preferred temperature is, that's where the sharks are going to be found. But if we look now at the, the historic range of these animals, these sharks have been historically found from about uh, South Florida up to around Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And the scientific literature states that they rarely go north of there, the occasional rare stray. But that scientific literature is written 70 years ago. And what we found, like I said, is that these sharks are actually going much farther than that they are going all the way up to Long Island consistently. And it basically has to do with warming ocean temperatures. The oceans are warming. Heat content of the ocean keeps getting higher and higher. The oceans are getting hotter. And the sharks are finding their preferred temperature at higher and higher latitudes. They used to prefer to summer off the Carolinas. That's where their preferred temperature is found. Now it's actually warm for them. Their preferred temperature is farther north. And so their migratory route is actually going farther north now and they're actually not coming quite as far south. That's another reason we're not seeing the huge numbers here anymore. As these sharks are migrating back down south in the fall, they're encountering their preferred water temperatures off, you know, maybe, I don't know, Cape Canaveral or, or Fort Pierce or something, and they're stopping there. They're not coming all the way down to South Florida like they used to, right? And so as ocean temperatures keep rising, we may be seeing a shift in the, the distribution of these animals 
to higher and higher latitudes, and they simply are not going to be coming down here in the huge numbers like, we, uh, like we've seen in the past. This is a dramatic change in just a matter of a few decades. So I think it's, uh, it, it, it's a warning call to us about the effects of global warming and how it is really impacting you know, even large scale movements of these top level predators. Well, the, the next thing that I wanted to sort of explore was what are these sharks doing when they're actually down here? You know, we're, they're here for a couple of months in the winter time, you know, like I said, around January through March or so. We want to see what they were doing and get more of a, a, a fine scale idea of their movements. And so for that, we've been starting to employ these data loggers. And what these data loggers do is they record a, a suite of different variables. Um, they record temperature, uh, water depth, the, the light level, swimming velocity, three axis acceleration, you know, the magnetic heading and, and magnetic intensity. And, and with all of these data, what we're able to do is basically reconstruct the fine scale movements of these animals. And so, uh, for example, and I'm just making this up, so it's not, this isn't real. But, uh, you know, maybe the sharks uh, swim, you know, back and forth, north and south, along the beach in shallow waters during the day. And then, you know, the light level drops at night. Maybe they head out to deeper water and they pick up speed and they swim faster and they chase down uh, their prey items in a more, uh, you know, uh, disorganized fashion. And then when the light level comes back up again, they head back in toward the shore and they swim back and forth along, you know, along the beach. You know, I may, like I said, I made that up. But that's the sort of reconstruction you can get with all this environmental data that you're collecting from these animals with these uh, fin mounted uh, data loggers. Now what they do is they, they stay on the animal for um, about you know anywhere from uh, one day to five days. And then they pop off, they float to the surface and then we're able to uh, see them. There's a, a little satellite transmitter on here so it gives us a location. Then there's a VHF transmitter as well. So we're able to go with a directional antenna and actually pinpoint the location of this little package on the uh, on the water, or sometimes they get washed up on the beach, and, and people call us to say that uh, they found our package on the beach. And so what we do is we bring the shark up along the boat, um, you know, measure it, instrument it with the uh, little package, take the hook out of the mouth, let it go, and then this little packet stays on the animal for, like I said, a couple of days, and then it pops off and gives us uh, information on its uh, on its movements. So again, getting more of this fine scale, this daily diary look at what the animals are doing uh, when they're down here really helps to inform us about the, uh, the movements and their, uh, the habitats that these sharks are, are utilizing when they're here. Well, the other thing that we've started to employ are uh, what we call block cams. And a block cam is literally just a GoPro camera screwed onto a concrete block. And uh, we lower that down into the water and there's little floats so we can you know, pick it up again. And it just, we set it to record and we just leave it. We drive away and we let it uh, record. And that way, um, the camera is recording for about, about 90 minutes, anything that swims by. So if a shark swim by, a little bait fish swim by, the camera's capturing all of that. And what we're then able to do is go back and look at this footage and we're able to uh, get sort of the fish eye view of what's happening down there. You know, we studied them from the sky uh, and now we're studying them from underwater as well. And what this sort of underwater view does is it helps to confirm the, uh, the, uh, the species identification. We know they're all black tips. You know, we can see that they're all males. Um, you know, we can see that they're all schooling. We can look at things like, uh, you know, velocity, tail beat frequency, you know, various other kinematics, uh, any sort of interactions among the animals. But what it also does is it enables us to look at their prey, all right? We are able to um, go back and look at the, whoops, go back and look not only at the number of sharks that are there, but also the number of prey fish that are there as well. So uh, we're able to count the little bait fish and say, all right, there's lots of bait fish in you know, January before the sharks get here. And then by the time the sharks leave in April, the bait fish population has crashed. And so this sort of underwater view gives us the uh, ability to quantify not only predator abundance, the shark abundance, but also the abundance of their prey. And we do that throughout the year. We try and drop these block camps at a fixed station at the North End of MacArthur Park um, every two weeks throughout the year. So we have a, a really good idea of when the sharks are here, but also when uh, bait fish are, are here in abundance and what species are here. Well, the last uh, little bit of uh, technology that we've been employing to study this uh, shark migration have been uh, aerial drones. 
I don't know if you guys have had an opportunity to fly these things, but they're they're relatively uh, inexpensive now. They're accessible. They're easy to fly. They're they're fun. Um, it, it's pretty cool uh, to fly them, and we use them for a couple of reasons. The uh, the first is probably the uh, you know the the easiest thing to do is is fly a drone to find out where the sharks are. When we go out fishing, we want to be very efficient. We want to tag as many animals as we can with the various types of transmitters that we use. And so we want to be able to drop our baits right on top of the uh, the sharks. And so what we're able to do when we get out there, um, you know, go out to the beach, see where the sharks are, or you know, or fly from the uh, fly from the boat, see where the sharks are, and again get some not only some stunning imagery that's useful for this sort of public outreach, but uh, also we use it to uh, to see where they are when we're fishing. So here's our boat, you know, we've got the drone in the air. And you can see all the sharks in the water. And again, you can see how close we are to the beach when we're setting these lines, right? We're, we're, we're right there. We're right as, as close as you can possibly get. Um, and by seeing where the sharks are, we're able to drop our lines right on top of them, be very uh, targeted in our fishing, and maximize our, uh, our efficiency at capturing these animals. And so it's, it's useful for that. And that's the, the one thing that we, uh, that we can use it for. But in addition, we're able to use the drones to get actual data, something that's that's quantifiable. And one of the things that we're able to do is look at the, the swimming kinematics of the animals. If you park a drone over top, you know, that's the advantage of these, they can hover, you know, it's like a cheap helicopter. Uh, you, you can park it over top of the school and you can have the shark swimming by underneath you. And from this, you can look at things like uh, schooling behavior. You can look at things like tail beat frequency. How many times do they beat their tail per, per minute? Um, you can look at things like, uh, whoops, um, you know, velocity, swimming velocity. You can look at uh, uh, packing density, how closely packed are they together? Are they all swimming together in a polarized school? Are they off doing their own thing? You know, you're able to get a lot of information about the swimming kinematics of the animal and their, their sort of social grouping as well from this sort of uh, top-down uh, drone eye view of the world. And then in addition to that, all that swimming data, we're able to also look at interactions among species. And so here, for example, we have, I hope you can see the, uh, the hammerhead coming in on the right side of the screen. And then you have your school of black tip sharks on the, uh, on the left side here. And I want you to notice a couple of things. I want you to notice first off how close that hammerhead can sneak up on these black tips before they notice that it's there. Um, and with this sort of bird's eye view, we're able to watch this sort of natural, predatory behavior, right? These, well, this is uh, obviously a failed attempt. Everyone swam away and the poor hammerhead got nothing. But um, we're able to look at how these animals are interacting with each other in the, uh, in the wild. And it's, it's unusual, it's rare, I guess, not unusual, it's rare for us to be able to actually observe natural predation. And so having this you know, eye in the sky gives us this top-down view, maximizes our probability of, uh, of encountering this, this sort of uh, you know this sort of predation event happening uh, right off our uh, right off our shores. This was off MacArthur Park a couple of years ago, and I'm just going to play it for a little bit longer. I want you to notice that the black tips are much more skittish now after they got scared that first time. They're not going to let that hammerhead anywhere near them, and the hammerhead is just continuing to cruise. But you'll see what happens in just a second when that hammerhead changes gears, and uh, it decides it's going to actually be serious about chasing down one of these black tips. And once it uh, once it starts, you can see a dramatic change in swimming uh, kinematics, the swimming behavior, the tail beat frequency increases, uh, its velocity increases, then there it goes. It's starting to chase them down right now. And off it goes trying to get these, uh, trying to get these black tips. We're going to cut it out before you see what actually happens, just you know, to save the more sensitive souls among you. Um, but what I do want to end with is just saying that these drones have really enabled us to get... Um, you know, really compelling footage and help us to better understand the uh, behaviors, the, the predatory interactions of these species in a way that we never could before. This would have been impossible to see from a boat, uh, certainly prohibitively expensive to sit there with a helicopter trying to, uh, to film this sort of stuff. And so I'll end just by pointing out that, you know what, it's that time of year when the sharks are here. The sharks are, uh, you know, supposed to be here in good numbers. You have lots of sharks in the water, lots of people on the beach, all the human snowbirds are here as well, right? And we're fortunate down here in South Florida that we have very few negative interactions between the humans and the sharks. 
relatively few people get bitten by these uh, sharks down here in Florida, uh, South Florida. And, and one of the reasons is we have such beautiful clear water most of the time. And with this clear water, it, it enables us to have, um, you know, enables the sharks, I guess, to easily distinguish us from a little bait fish, right? We're big, giant, clumsy humans in the water. We don't look anything like a little, a little menhaden that they're feeding on. Um, and so the shark leaves us alone. Uh, where people get bitten is farther north. I mean, you got murkier water, um, and the shark has a little harder time distinguishing the shiny little bait fish from maybe, say, the palm of your hand catching the, the light. Um, that's where people get bitten. So go off like New Smyrna, Daytona area. That's where people are getting hit on the hands and on the feet, you know, the shiny parts of the body that, uh, that uh, the sharks are, are biting at. But uh, down here, we're fortunate that we have relatively few interactions, and I, I encourage people, even though there's lots of sharks in the water, don't let that be, don't let that stop you from getting out and enjoying uh, yourself. Go, you know, go out to the beach, enjoy it. And if you see a shark, that's great. Um, you're never gonna get close to them at the beach. They are so skittish, they're just gonna bolt out of your way. Uh, but if you happen to see one, that's you know, counted as a, as a good thing. Um, and remember that sharks are an important part of our ecosystem. We want to see lots of sharks. That's, you know, that's, that's indicative of a healthy ecosystem. So uh, I encourage people to uh, enjoy the sharks when they're here, get down to the beach, look for them. You can see them sometimes right in the waves and, uh, you know, take advantage of this, this natural phenomenon that occurs right in our own backyard. Well, I'm going to just end by acknowledging the Colgan Foundation. They've been strong supporters of our work for a number of years, and we're very grateful for their uh, continued support of our of our research. Um, and uh, if you're on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, feel free to follow us. We are at Shark Migration. Um, this is our busy time of year, so we, we try and post every couple of days or so something that's that's happening. And also everything uh, gets ported to our Facebook page, FAU Shark Migration, so you can keep track of what we're doing on there as well. So with that, I'm going to uh, end it turn it over to, uh, uh, to questions and say thank you once again for the, uh, the opportunity to uh, share some of our work with you. Wonderful, that was excellent. Thank you so much. All Thanks. right. So we had a ton of great questions um, come in over the past couple, um, like half hour while you were talking. So just bear with me, I'm going to um, pull some of those up. All right. So one of the first ones, um, so we, you know, we mentioned that as the temperatures increase, um, the sharks are here looking for that colder water. So we're seeing um, fewer shark populations um, in the migration. Have you guys noticed or has anybody researched or noticed a difference in the um, like year round shark populations? So as divers, you know, we see sharks now uh, a ton, but we do see them throughout the year, and I'm wondering if there's a change in, in that um, with the rising ocean temperatures. That's, that's a great question, and we actually were supposed to start tagging sharks in the summertime um, in last, last year, but COVID you know, shut down our field work for like a year, so we couldn't do anything. Um, but that is something that we are very interested in addressing. You know, what's happening with these resident sharks that stay here year round. We're, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I give me a couple of years. You know, hopefully we'll get to it this year, and uh, I'll tag a bunch of sharks and have an answer for you in two years from now. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know what what they're doing, but it's certainly something that we are are interested in addressing. Okay, perfect. We're gonna hold you to that. <laughs> so in a couple of years, we'll be back. <laughs> Um, all right, so there was a question about basically what percentages of the sharks that are migrating offshore are each different species? So which percentage are black tips, which percentage are like spinner sharks, hammerheads, things like that? Right, right. We have focused uh, exclusively on the black tips that are hanging out close to the beach. And the reason is those are the ones that are near the people. So that was the, uh, the, the impetus for the study it was uh, that. Um, we know that there's other sharks that migrate up down here. So like sandbar sharks, for example, you know, they're, they're migrating down um, and they're probably doing the same thing, but uh, they're farther offshore. We're not, we're not tagging those, so we don't have the data. My, my colleague um, up in Massachusetts, he tags white sharks and uh, we detect his white sharks on our acoustic receivers down here in the wintertime. So his, his instrumented sharks are being picked up down here in, in Palm Beach County as well. So uh, we know the white sharks are coming down from Massachusetts in the wintertime. So 
there's a bunch of other species that are doing the same thing. Uh, you mentioned the lemons that you're going to do your lemon dive, you know, things like that. Um, we, we haven't looked at all of them. We've, we've only looked at the black tip, so I can only comment on those uh, at this point. But uh, we know that other sharks are doing the same sort of migration up and down, but it's the black tips that get the attention because they're the ones right up against the beach. That, they're the ones that the people see. And that was uh, sort of the, uh, you know, the, the motivation for looking at those first. But okay, give us excellent. Time. We'll, look at <laughs> well, that brought up another great question. What, what is drawing the sharks so close to shore? Yeah. So these sharks, they're, they're medium-sized sharks. They're not particularly huge. And um, they're feeding on little bait fish. So little, little mullets and menhadens and things like that that are hanging out in the shallow waters. And so that's one of the reasons these sharks are so close to shore is that's where their food is. The other reason they're close to shore is that's where the big sharks are not. Um, so these sharks are prey. You saw them being chased by that, that big hammerhead, right? And those hammerheads will come you know, fairly shallow. What we found, just, we just documented this recently, we wrote a paper last year, is that these black tips are able to get even shallower. They're, they're right up in the, uh, in the uh, right up against the beach, basically. And they can get shallower to stay out of the way of those bigger sharks. The black, the, excuse me, the, the hammerheads can't get that shallow. They come up and chase them and they have to turn around and go back into deeper water. And the black tips are able to hug, you know, hug the beach there. And so that's another reason is to stay out of the way of the bigger sharks the shallow water against the beach acts as a refuge for them. They're able to, uh, to stay there and, and not get eaten. So, um, you know, the, the abundance of food close to the beach and the absence of predators close to the beach, both of those factors combine to allow the, uh, the black tips to, uh, you know, basically hug the, hug the shoreline. Okay, interesting, good reasons. <laughs> um, we had a question similarly on the same vein, how many black tip sharks could or would um, something like a hammerhead, a larger shark, eat in one day? Oh, that's a great <laughs> question. How many, how many black tips does it take to fill up a hammerhead? Um, well, let me, I'll, let me start with this. Uh, these black tips, like I said, they're about, they're about five foot, you know, five and a half, six feet long, right? Um, and the, the hammerheads that are feeding on them are like double that size. And you can eat a big a meal that's you know half your body length and that's going to keep you going for a long time these hammerheads you know have a fairly high energetic rate but still they're they're still cold bodied and so a hammerhead eating a black tip i think it's going to be it's going to be several days you know well, i mean uh, a couple of weeks probably realistically before that black tips excuse me that hammerhead is going to want to eat again and uh if if your crowd is interested you can poll them if ask them if they want to see what happened to that black tip after the Hammerhead. I've got that video on tap. So you think about that and you determine if anyone wants to see that. If they don't want to, that's fine. But if they want to, I'll show you what happened uh, after the fact. Uh, um, yeah, overwhelmingly, I think they want to see it. <laughs> oh, wait, okay. All right. So, um, well, yeah, if we can do that, maybe like right at the end, that way you have the option yep. to go if you don't want to see it. But yeah, overwhelmingly, the <laughs> chat is like, definitely, and one maybe. <laughs> Um, okay, okay. <laughs> so how frequently do you estimate that sharks are surfacing throughout their day? Oh, that's a great question. Because these transmitters, they're only transmitting when the, the fin's out of the water, right? And so this was one of the concerns we had. Are we throwing money on something that's never going to come up to the surface? Um, which was a real concern. These transmitters are not cheap. What we found is that of the sharks that we've instrumented, about 70% of them are, are popping up and we're getting hits from. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that, considering you're basically throwing this transmit into the ocean and hoping for the best. Um, and so uh, I wish we had more hits. Obviously, I wish all of them were you know, popping up every day, but you know, we're doing a pretty good job at uh, instrumenting several animals and getting an overall view of the, the movements of these, these sharks. And it's pretty consistent across the board, multiple individuals that we've looked at have all done basically the same thing, where they've uh, you know, popped up close to the beach, all the way up the coast, and then all the way back down again. So um, yeah, it's, it's you know, maybe 70, not, not, it's not three quarters, it's, but it's, it's close to, uh, to that, that number that we're getting hits from. 
Okay, excellent. Um, we did have a question regarding where shark pups generally, where are they born? Is there um, a specific location that you're finding a lot of pups and or um, throughout their lifespan, are sharks really primarily continuously moving or is there one spot that they're calling home? Right, so with these black tips, for example, uh, the females will give birth in uh, the, the coastal estuaries around Georgia and the North and South Carolina. And so these are well-known sort of uh, nursery grounds where the females will come in, drop their pups, the pups will stay there for a year or so till they grow up and then they'll move off and join the adult population. And uh, when the sharks are down here, they're, well, basically what they're doing is they're basically moving back and forth, back and forth, north and south along the eastern seaboard. You know, from New York down to Florida, New York down to, there's snowbirds, New York to Florida, that's what they do every year. Um, and so they're, they're constantly moving. Uh, when they're down here, they're here for a couple of months and they just sort of mill around in the area in, in South Florida. Palm Beach County seems to be the southern extent of their, their migration now. Uh, and then they, they move more. So they're basically constantly moving, spend a few months down here and then they just move their way north and then move their way back uh, down south again. Um, and when these uh, females, after they drop their pups, after they give birth, they'll take a year off um, and they, they won't reproduce for a year. Uh, they'll you know build themselves back up again, and then the following year, that's when they'll mate and they'll uh, you know carry the pups the, the next year. So it's a one year pregnant, one year off, one year pregnant, one year off sort of deal. Um, and so that's what they're doing throughout their uh, throughout their life. Okay, very interesting. Um, how many black tips do you currently have tagged, and how many total have you been able to tag and collect data from um, over the past decade? Right. So uh, we started the tagging work about five years ago. We've tagged, yikes, I don't remember off the top of my head, uh, a couple hundred, you know, several, of, a bunch of them that we tag just with an ID tag, right? So it's all, all the sharks we catch, we stick an ID tag on. These are issued by uh, NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service gives us these ID tags. We, every shark gets one of those. Um, the subset of those get transmitters. And so we've probably put transmitters on over a hundred sharks now with acoustic transmitters. And we've probably put about 30 something transmit uh, satellite transmitters on sharks as well. So whatever that works out to in grand total, uh, it's, it's a lot of sharks that we've caught and we've been able to instrument and uh, you know, we're doing other things as well. Some of these daily diary tags, for example, they're only on for a few days and they pop off. And so the shark has nothing, no hardware stuck to it. It's, you know, the tag just releases and floats away. Um, and so those are other tags that we've uh, put on sharks, but they're, they're not, you know, they're not, not long-term tags at all. Okay, interesting. Um, are there any regulations in place that you're aware of to help prevent anglers hooking sharks, especially when there are so many so close to shore? Mm. There's, uh, there's a popular uh, shore-based recreational fishery for these black tips. A lot of people will go out um, and, and uh, catch sharks just you know, for the fun of it. And if it's done well and done right, um, that's, that's fine. Uh, and fortunately, Florida has uh, implemented these uh, shark fishing rules now so that anyone who does shore-based shark fishing has to go through a, a, a fish and wildlife approved course, an FWC, you know, shark fishing course. Um, so that's good. Um, and as long as, you know, you keep the shark in the water, let the, you know, take the hook out very quickly and let it go on its merry way, you, there's minimal uh, stress to the animal. And in terms of commercial fishing, there is actually still commercial fishing. We can go out and uh, some of these uh, vessels will take advantage of the fact that you have these big aggregations of sharks and, and basically uh, round them up. Um, but there are, at least in Florida, there's, there's catch limits for uh, commercial fishing. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't know the numbers off the top of my head, how many sharks per boat or whatever per day, but uh, there, it, is, it is a managed fishery, um, not only locally in the state, but also uh, federally in, in uh, federal waters as well. Um, and black tip is one of, the, one of the two big commercial species that people will eat for shark meat. You can go to Publix and see black tip, you know, it's, it's there. You can, you can buy a locally caught black tip for sale. Um, incidentally, I, I don't recommend eating it because uh, they're loaded with mercury. They have very high levels of, of, uh, of mercury in the tissue. So if you want to eat it, I mean, it's up to you, but yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't. It's like you know, eating a thermometer, man. It's, it's just not good for you. 
Okay, excellent. Um, thank you for yeah sharing that info. Um, and we did uh, just so you guys all have some resources. Um, we did a, a a presentation with the American Shark Conservancy a few months ago, specifically yeah. talking about shark fishing, um, and some of the regulations and policies um, that are happening there. So that's up on our social media if you guys want to reference it. And that's a great organization to learn more about the legislation um, and the fishing rules that are are imposed on people who are fishing for sharks. Um, super informative as well, but thank you. Um, okay, what's the average age of the black tips that you are tagging offshore? Right, so these black tips, they only live about about 12 to 14 years, um, you know, 16 at the absolute outside. So they're not a long-lived species. Um, and they reach adult size after about three or four years. And at that point, once they're adult size, it's hard to tell a, a four-year-old from a 14-year-old. You know, they're, they're about the same size. They look pretty much exactly the same. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know the exact age of the animals that we're looking at, but, uh, you know, we are only getting adult males down here in the wintertime. Those, those huge aggregations of thousands of sharks, they're all males. You know, all our fishing, hundreds of individuals, males. Um, and so, you know, they're, you're, um, getting large adult males coming down in the wintertime and that's, you know, whatever age they are, that's, that's what they are. Okay, interesting. Uh, we had a fun question. Can sharks distinguish color? Uh, this is a good <laughs> one. Okay. So there's been some work on this in just the, the last few years. Uh, previously, it was thought that sharks couldn't see color. All right, they, everything was, was black and white to them, basically. And then there was some work that showed that they can distinguish, you know, yellows from reds or blues from greens or something or other. And then recently, and then more recently, as in the last couple of years, they looked at the, uh, the retinas and they found out, you know what, they're monochromatic. They only have one type of, of photoreceptor cell. We have three, right? We can, we can distinguish color, but sharks theoretically can't. They're, it's like watching black and white TV for them. And so the previous work that showed that they could see color was probably just different intensities of light rather than different colors. Uh, and so that's the current state. So it's gone back and forth. It's gone from they can't see color to yes, they can. And now it's back to no, they can't. So I think that's the current, <laughs> the current state of affairs. Okay, interesting. Um, to touch on the previous point, um, as you mentioned, it's, it's male sharks that are, are migrating down. Um, is there any idea as to why it, we only see male sharks migrating in mass? You know, there's, here's what's interesting. The females are, uh, mating takes place in, uh, you know, around May or June or so, right? And then um, the females and, and males are obviously there together for the mating in, in the Carolinas. And then uh, you know they they go off on their separate ways, and then during the and during the fall they they start moving south again. Here's what I think is happening, and I don't have any data yet. So this is my my pet hypothesis. Um, if you've ever been out at the mall and you've watched a couple walking, and the wife is pregnant and the husband is not, and you watch them walking, what happens? The husband pulls up in front of the wife because she can't keep up. She's pregnant. She she can't swim as fast or can't excuse me walk as fast. And so I'm guessing, and this is just a hypothesis, I'm guessing it might be something similar with these females. As they're moving their way south, the males just keep booking it, and they just come all the way farther down south, and the females, uh, they just can't swim quite as fast as them. And they say, you know, you go, you go, I'm staying here in Cape Canaveral or something. Um, and that might be why we're seeing these males all the way down here, and we're seeing the females uh, a little bit farther north. They're simply not, not coming quite as far. And again, I'm I don't have any data yet. That's just my my pet hypothesis, but I, I want I want to see if I'm right. So stay tuned. I think that's a good reality based hypothesis. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, um, all right. This is a fun one. So have you seen any evidence um, of shark behavior changing based on sharks being fed offshore? Um, and or do you have any personal thoughts and opinions that you'd like to share about that? Right, so uh, I haven't seen anything uh, uh, inshore with the black tips that we're that we're working with, um, and they're just simply not part of that. You know, the offshore shark uh, baiting, fishing, or uh, excuse me, baiting, uh, attracting uh, dive operations and stuff. Uh, I've heard anecdotally um, that people have said that you know the sharks are 
clearly well well trained to this and you know they hear the boat motors and they start milling around or, or whatever um I, I have not been on those sorts of shark dives. I, uh, I went on one a number of years ago and I have not ever done one since. So I don't know enough about it. I can only go by what I've heard from other people that it seems to be, you know, uh, attracting the sharks. So um, that's, you know, with, without going into speculation on, on what other people have told me, I can't, I can't comment. I don't have firsthand experience. So I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I will say this, sharks can learn, you know, and they can learn to associate sounds with food rewards. And so I'm not surprised that a shark will hear the hum of the, the boat motor and start, you know, start milling around that area. Um, that's, that's well within their wheelhouse. So I'm, I believe that that's capable, you know, that that's possible, but I, I simply don't have any firsthand experience to be able to, to comment on that. That's very interesting. I had no idea that sharks could potentially be trained. So We'll see. We'll see who's out there diving with like yeah, a weird was, noise, <laughs> trying to get right. Oh, the work was done in the in the fifties, right? Because people were saying, "Oh, sharks are so stupid; they don't learn anything." But they showed Eugenie Clark did this in, in Moat Marine Lab years ago. Uh, she said, "No, you can get them to swim through hoop, push a button, get a food reward, just like a little dolphin would, right?" Uh, so they're not they're not stupid animals. They they have a capacity. That's very interesting. Um, if a shark with a tracker is caught, is there any re regulation that it must be released? There's no regulation that it should be released. But uh, if you happen to get one, if, you know, if, you're, if you're fishing and, and you happen to get one, um, well, for example, the, uh, I brought this just to show you. One of the, uh, you can't see the whole thing, but this is, this is the little satellite transmitter. Right, there's the VHF transmitter. We've got written on here in giant letters, reward, call <laughs> XXX. So if you see that, call the number. I, I guarantee we will immediately come running out there to get our, our, our package from you. Um, but if, if nothing else, there's a, little, uh, there's a little capsule tag on it with a number. Um, record that number and um, you know, uh, you know, call us. You know, we, will, we will take full advantage of that information. Even if you let it go, that's fine, you know, just to know that you caught it and where it was caught and, you know, what, what, what tag number it was, that's, that's tremendous information. Okay, excellent. Yeah, guys, keep an eye out when you're diving or walking the beach. Um, can you give and us an- Incidentally, a scuba yeah. diver, well, just briefly, a scuba diver did find one of our uh, transmitters on the sea floor. Um, was it last, two years ago now? Um, and so it had fallen off and he actually found it, was able to contact my student, Ryan, it said, hey, I found this on the floor. It's got your number on it. And so we we're able to retrieve that. And so that's, that's great because we're able to reuse these, these transmitters again, right? And so that was, uh, hey, scuba divers have been extremely helpful in helping us find our, uh, our equipment that, that sometimes falls off and doesn't float. Excellent. We will keep our eyes peeled. All right. Um, shark intelligence versus other animals. Can you give us like an approximation of where sharks fall intelligence wise between some other animal species? Right. It's, it's, the problem is it's hard to really define intelligence. But what we can talk about is brain mass. Brain mass to body mass ratio. How big is your brain compared to the rest of your body? And sharks actually have a surprisingly a big brain uh, for size of their body. They fall um, in between uh, birds and mammals. All right. So they are, they're not little bird brains. They're bigger than that. They're not mammal brains, but you know, they're, they're somewhere in that range. Uh, and so they actually have a surprisingly big brain for the size of body. Now, the problem with using that metric is a lot of that brain is devoted to processing odors, um, things like that, that aren't higher, not, not really cognitive function, but you know, not really uh, learning sort of things. Um, and so, yes, they have a big brain, but you know, a third of it is devoted to processing smell. So you know, they've got a big brain, but I'm not convinced they're necessarily smart. They'd, like I said, we've been able to train them and they can remember. That's the other thing. Not only can you train the, the shark to do a task, you know, swim through a little maze or whatever, um, you can leave it alone. And six months later, without any reinforcement, you ask it to do the same thing again, it'll remember what to do and it'll do it. Uh, so that's been documented in a, a number of shark species as well. So they, are, they, have, they have some you know, some capacity to not only learn, but also remember for relatively long periods of time. That's very interesting. 
Okay, um, and then I think we have our final question. So are the, the black tips that we're seeing offshore here, are those the same species that you would find over in Indonesia? Um, are they a different species? And then can you pinpoint some differences? Sure. So the ones that you're probably talking about in Indonesia are a different species, uh, reef black tips or Carcharhinus melanopterus. All right, they're, they're smaller sharks. They have a very distinct black tip on the, uh, on the dorsal fin, usually with a white stripe underneath it. Um, and those are a different species from these ones here. This is Carcharhinus limbatus. And uh, I know it's confusing because these common names get used a lot. Um, but uh, the species found here, Carcharhinus limbatus, is found around the world. So you can find Carcharhinus limbatus off in Indonesia as well, as well as the other, the other black tip. Um, and so it's, it just makes things confusing all around. But the ones you guys are probably referring to are Carcharhinus melanopterus. They're smaller. Um, they are, uh, you know, beautiful little sharks with their very, you know, distinct black and white uh, stripes on their, uh, on their dorsal fins. Um, and they are found in shallow waters right up against the, uh, the beach as well, basically, because that's where they're foraging on these uh, nearshore reefs, but uh, different species altogether. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, oh, and then final one. What, in your opinion, um, are maybe the smarter species of sharks, if we know that? <laughs> ah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I would, I would guess that there's two different ways to look at this. One is complexity of social behavior, right? You've got some things that just sit on the bottom by themselves and don't pay any attention. They're, they're fine, but you know, they're not particularly interesting. Others have this social behavior, like, like the big schools of hammerheads, for example, that these, these big schools of black tips where they are not only doing their own thing, but they're also interacting with all their, their, their peers around them. And so there, I think you have real potential to have more, I don't, you can't really call it higher cognitive function, but uh, you know, more, more, uh, processing of, of information, let's say. Uh, and so I think that's what I would pitch. I would, if I were to guess, I would put hammerheads pretty high up there um, just because they have an enormous brain and they have these complex social behaviors where, you know, the, the smaller ones will give way to the bigger ones and things like that. So there's, there's clearly something going on there with the, uh, with these hammerhead sharks. Very interesting. Um, so before we move on to other things, so how can we support you and um, and your research and what does the future of your research look like? Yeah, the, the future of our research is, um, it's, it's always changing. You know, this seems that no matter what you do, there's always something else that pops up. You know, it's in, I've been doing this for a number of years and I said, oh, we should do this. Oh, we should do this. Oh, we should do this. There's so many different avenues that, uh, that we can go through. You know, one of the things that I appreciate is these sort of opportunities to engage with the public and, and inform people about the work that's being conducted right here in their backyard, right? Um, and I think that's, you know, as, as you know, your, your role in, as, as marketing for Pure Vita, that's something you can do is give us this forum to uh, be able to, to talk to people because I think this is a great way to take the, the, the data that we're collecting and make it accessible to the public. Research isn't done until people know about it. You know, I can have said, be sitting on a ton of data, it doesn't do anyone any good unless the rest of the world hears about it. So I think that's something that you guys can do and, and you have done. So uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to share. No, thank you for, for sharing your research with us. It's the sharks is always a hot topic. People love them. Um, they're one of our favorite things to see offshore. And I, I think we, They've, you know, everybody tonight asked some questions that I never would have even thought to ask, but it's such interesting information. Um, so, is it possible to view the end of the Hammerhead video yeah. today? Okay. Let me, I will cue that up for you. And uh, just so you know, so what happened, it was one of those impossible days where it's like a Nat Geo program. Nothing like this ever happened before. Um, we had the, the Hammerhead with the dead black tip in its mouth, all right, swimming along uh, right by our boat. It was right, right beside our boat. And so I was surprised that it got as close as it did. I had a GoPro camera on a stick and I said, Ryan, Ryan, drive the boat quick, quick, quick. And I stuck the camera in the water, you know, underwater. And I couldn't see what I was recording, just sort of aiming it in the general area saying, I, I think this is probably, you know, I'm probably getting it. 
Um, and the shark kept swimming away with this dead black tip in its mouth. I said, keep going, keep going. You know, so I pulled the camera out. He had to drive forward. I had to stick it in again. What you'll see was amazing. So let me try and share this one more Here, time. I'm going to go ahead and um, oh, okay. yep. set that. Okay, you should be able to share screen. All right, let me try this again. And as a reminder, guys, if you don't want to see this, go ahead and sign out. We will have the presentation recording um, up online so you can come back to it. Um, and if we have any additional questions and things like that, um, you know, I'll be in touch with Dr. Kajira to keep asking those. Um, so if you're not into this, please feel free to sign off. But if you are, stick around. I think it's going to be awesome. <laughs> it's not that bad, really. But um, here's, here's what happened. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, the video from the GoPro. You can see the dead black tip hanging out the mouth of that, that hammerhead as it was swimming away, trying to, trying to keep up with it. I want you to remember that black tip's about the same size as me. It's about five and a half feet long. All right, so that hammerhead's big. And then what happened? Oh no, another hammerhead came up, an even bigger one. And it chased down the first hammerhead who had the dead shark. And so this is what I was saying to Ryan. So the first hammerhead drops the dead shark. And I was saying to Ryan, drive the boat, drive the boat, drive the boat. I tried to stick the GoPro back underwater again. And when we did that, what you can see is the second hammerhead takes that black tip that's about, you know, five and a half feet long, and it swims off with it in its, in its mouth. And you can see that all that's left is the tail sticking out of the mouth of that big hammerhead. And the second hammerhead, which was actually the first one who caught it, is swimming after him, basically demanding his, his black tip back. But that first hammer, that second hammer had the bigger one, basically swallowed the whole thing. So that was it. It was one of those, this never happens. But uh, we happened to be in the right place at the right time. And they happened to, uh, we happened to record all of this happening. I wish we, I, mean, I wish we could have been in the water with a camera to get all this, but it was just, it was just happening so quick. We were, uh, we were fortunate to get what we did. And I, uh, I think it's just so cool to actually see not only one hammerhead eat a black tip, but two, you know, another one chase it down and, uh, you know, actually witness uh, a, a black tip being eaten. Uh, so that was it. amazing. That but, yeah, no, <laughs> it's not that bad, but thank you very much for sharing that. I think, yeah, everybody is really wanting to see it. So we appreciate that a lot. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Well, everybody in the chat, um, we do have those tags for social media. Um, so you guys can find them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, following on social media is a great way to stay up to date, to see you know, additional research being conducted locally. Um, and then if there are additional instances of presentations and things like that, certainly encourage you guys to tune in. Um, and learn even more about research and, and we usually we like to you know host you every couple of years and kind of catch up and see what's changed so definitely appreciate you joining us tonight um, and certainly looking forward to you know years more of research and, and shark facts and findings it's always very interesting um, and tons of thank yous coming into the chat right now Great. awesome all right so as a quick reminder everybody um, we have tons of shark events this month, so join us for a shark dive, a shark conservation class, um, or join us for the lemon shark dive up in Jupiter, um, or the shark photo workshop. So there are tons of shark task fantastic things um, happening this month. If you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot me a message in the Zoom chat um, or follow Pure Vita Divers on social media, and we will have the entire presentation recorded um, from this evening. We'll go ahead and share that there as well. Well, um, and then I think thank you, Dr. Kujer. That was amazing. <laughs> that was really thank wonderful. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. Excellent. All right. All right. Hopefully, we'll see everybody on the boat soon, and and even more exciting shark research soon to come. <laughs> Thanks, guys.